Joining me today in studio for a year in review, as well as a bit of an outlook at the year ahead, is BC Liberals leader Andrew Wilkinson. Good to have you back. Thanks, Thanks for coming Thanks for in. having me. Tell me, what were some of your highlights over the past year? Well, it's been a busy, busy year. I took on the leadership job on February the 3rd, and immediately there was the issue of making sure the caucus was on side, and that went very well. And my uh, competitors and leadership race came on board in a very big way, and it's been a very solid experience through the spring. Our job is to hold the NDP to account. We did that through the spring with their aggressive tax agenda and pointing out to the public this is not going to work out well. And then in the fall, we've had a very interesting time as they've been less and less interested in the state of the economy and more and more interested in spending. And that's a big problem for us in British Columbia. And we'll dive into that in a little bit, but I want to ask you what you've learned since taking over the leadership of the party. It's a very busy job. And it's, you know, a 14-hour day is normal, 16, 18-hour day is not unusual. And it's a lot of fun. You know, people say it's a tough job and they'll be miserable doing it. I'm actually having a great time. So I'm not sure what these people are talking about in terms of it being a nasty job. It's not at all. It's a very positive job. You meet great people all over the province who say they want this to be a better place. Now, our audience has been very concerned of late about BC's competitiveness and Canada's competitiveness. And yep. recently, the federal government made some tax changes that addresses some of that in part. But when you look at our province's standing, how competitive is BC at the close of the year? It's a big issue because in the past year, the U.S. government has dropped their corporate income tax rate by 40 percent from 35 percent at the margin to 21 percent. That causes a lot of concern in Canada because it's easier to move their capital to the USA. And people don't notice that for a while, but they will notice it over time. In addition to that, on the bad side of the ledger, the NDP have increased 18 taxes or introduced new taxes. And that's a big problem because it means that people trying to get ahead in our society here in BC have less and less in their pocket as the cost of living has not gone down. Is the answer simply removing or reducing those taxes? Or are there other measures that maybe could run in tangent with some of the tax increases the NDP have brought about? There needs to be a kind of coordinated approach to say what's going to be good for small and medium-sized businesses in this province. We have to have very strong private sector employers here. That's where the engine of the economy is. You cannot tax your way to prosperity. And the NDP seem to think that it's okay to hire more and more and more people in the public payroll, but that doesn't lead to economic growth. That just leads to more taxes. We also know the NDP has a very ambitious agenda around more social spending, housing affordability being one, child care, the health care system being other areas. And in the 2017 election, it was clear British Columbians did maybe want more spending in those key areas. And we've had you on the show before to talk about maybe what went wrong or what was missed in that election. How do you balance the two? Because these are very expensive agendas. Yeah, I think the key thing is that British Columbians are looking for more results. That doesn't necessarily mean more spending. What the NDP promised is 115,000 new housing units in British Columbia. So far, they've delivered two or 3,000 modular housing units for homeless people. It has made no difference to the vast majority of British Columbians in spite of the big flowery promise. At the same time, they're increasing the taxes and the costs of housing, which makes it less likely that housing will be built. So they tell people, we're going to have a lot more housing, but it's not going to be for you. And in fact, it'll be more difficult for you to find housing. That's a failed promise. The second thing, child care, you know, they promised $10 a day daycare, total failure. They've now got a pilot program to save face of 2,000 spaces, leaving 104,000 spaces without the $10 a day. So they flagrantly broke that promise. And interestingly, we found out in Victoria, they announced one day that there were 250 new spaces, but 450 had closed because the operators couldn't work under the new NDP rules. So there's a net loss of childcare spaces when young families are looking for a place for their kids to do well and prosper, and they're getting bad results from the NDP, not good results, and it all comes at increased cost. They've increased taxes by $5.8 billion this year to pay for these things, but their delivery has been a total failure. So we have to look at this very critically and say, what are the results? The NDP want to talk about their inputs in terms of spending, People and regular folks and you and I want to say, where's the beef? What was the outcome? So what would the Liberals then do differently if you had a shot at power again when it comes to housing and then child care? Housing is a critical one because clearly when we have 60,000 people moving to BC every year for the last 30 years, they're going to have to live somewhere. If you do the, the math, that's about a million people in the next 25 years here in the lower mainland alone. 
Where are they going to live? We're going to have to build more housing. We're going to have to free up the uh, complex municipal planning processes so that things can get moving a bit faster and also make sure that these housing units are actually affordable and in the right kind of uh, layout in communities with respect to transit. That's a big challenge and the NDP are not doing much about it. And on child care? Child care is an interesting one because we have to make sure that there's a range of child care options from state run through uh, sponsored things like through schools and churches right through to family daycares where someone like me says, well, I'm going to be at home with my child or my two kids, so I'll take in the neighbor's kid as well. There's nothing wrong with that. And the NDP seem to think that there's a state-run solution that'll be much better than that. And that's a big chunk of the flexible daycare in our society is the informal sector. We've got to make sure it's safe, but at the same time, you cannot crush that because then it goes underground and disappears. It's important, of course, for municipalities to be able to design their own communities and have an important hand to play in that. We've also heard from developers that it can be very challenging. It's inconsistent. It's unclear municipality to municipality when they're building the housing that we need. What role could BC play in that with still respecting the authority and independence of municipalities? There's a huge range here from Langford and Vancouver Island and Surrey here in the mainland that actually move quite quickly through this stuff. Langley's another one that does it quite well. And the the time to get to development can be a five-fold range. City of Vancouver is probably the slowest of them all. And what we've seen in the city of Vancouver is we're only getting the premium fancy places along Camby Street in downtown. Where's the affordable housing? It's nowhere to be seen. Think about the crossroads of commercial and and Broadway where the Millennium Line came in to cross the Expo Line 18 years ago. The number of social housing or other housing units built there in 18 years is zero. That's a failure of planning. So what role then could the province potentially play to try and expedite some of these projects? Incentives. Mm. When you see strong, good behavior, when you see things going well in a community, you say you're doing a great job and reward them with transit funding. Okay. Have you met Vancouver's new mayor and council? No, I haven't. I know five of the councillors, six actually, and uh, I haven't met the mayor. Okay. He has an ambitious agenda around housing as well, so perhaps there might be opportunities there. Yeah. the, The problem we have with cities chronically is they talk a lot about things that aren't in their jurisdiction, whether it's climate change or criminal justice or housing funding. They don't have the tools. And so they set up these grand aspirational goals and then blame somebody else. What they've got to do is work with provincial and federal governments to make things happen rather than run around blaming them. To that point, what do you think about the discussions around changing the regional transportation plan away from LRT in Surrey, which has been a long time coming, over to SkyTrain in Surrey? Yeah, that's an interesting one because there was a solid commitment to that from the previous council. Doug McCallum and his new council came in and reversed the decision. And interestingly, the feds have said they don't mind. The money's there. You can do whatever you want to with it. And the mayor's council, I gather, has said that's okay with them. And so we're left with the provincial government being the ones who are blocking the road. So it's time for John Horgan and company to kind of wake up and smell the roses in Surrey and realize that the tide has turned and there's going to be a different way of doing things. It's pretty attractive, actually, to have a continuously connected transit system so you could get on somewhere between Surrey and Langley and ride all the way through Douglas College and either Coquitlam or New Westminster and all the way through Burnaby to Vancouver rather than having to change systems. That means you're going to get wet, there are going to be delays, there are going to be lineups. Why not just have one system? Is that seamlessness and convenience worth the potential added cost of implementing SkyTrain? That's always the question. And that's why we need a much better transportation plan for the Lower Mainland to figure out where we're going to be in 30 years. There's often a lot of grumbling that, oh, that's a line to nowhere. But if you're going to put 100,000 people down the road, that's worth it. The trick is that the municipalities are reluctant to talk about where those 100,000 people are going to go. They'd rather just build a SkyTrain to nowhere and leave it that way. And so we've got to talk about rewarding uh, density with transit. I have to ask you about the Nanaimo by-election. You've been on the ground in the community, I understand. How's the campaign going? Really well. Our candidate there is phenomenal. Tony Harris, the family moved to Nanaimo in 1876. They're sixth generation in Nanaimo. Every door you go to and knock on it, they, you hand them the brochure with a picture of Tony and the name, and they say, oh yeah, we know him. He's a good guy. And you say, well, are you looking for a change? He's with the BC Liberals. And they say, yeah, sure, that sounds good. So the reception on the doorstep is phenomenally good. So we're pretty optimistic about it. Yeah, you think you can win? Oh, we sure hope so, because if we do, it changes the whole ballgame. 
Yeah, tell me what will then happen. As I understand it, it would mean that it's a 43-43 split in terms of the Liberals and then the BC NDP and BC Greens. What does that mean for the governance of our province? Well, in the fall, there were two votes that were 42 to 42. And that means the Speaker had to to break the vote in, by voting in favor of the NDP. You can only do that for so long. And certainly when it's the budget, which is $55 billion, and probably more under the NDP, you can't have the Speaker basically voting uh, for the NDP every time. So it created a lot of instability, and there could well be an election in 2019. ICBC is another issue I want to raise that was an issue with the previous government. It continues to be an issue now. What would you like to see? Well, ICBC is a 45-year-old state-run monopoly. Nobody likes it now. Why are we doing it this way? We're the only place in the world that does it this way. What's so special about us? So it's time to look around North America, Australia, New Zealand, the UK. There are a billion people out there buying auto insurance. It's not just us. So let's figure out what works best. Get the best deal for the customer, for the motorist, for the person who's buying insurance. And stop patching up this big bloated monopoly with, with scotch tape. The BC NDP has said that they will not support or entertain the idea of no fault. Is that something the Liberals might entertain? Well, no fault's used in Saskatchewan and a complicated arrangement in Quebec. And so the question arises, is it a good idea or not? Let's have a look at it. And let's have a look at the other commercial opportunities around uh, the English-speaking world. Mm -hmm. A great example is taxi insurance. We're told that when you start a taxi on day one of the year, you pay $37,000 in insurance. No wonder the taxi industry is hungry all the time. So if you get more flexible insurance, that might drive down the cost of the taxi business and make it more viable. So you start to think about 5,000 taxis in the province. Why don't we open that up to private insurers? Why not do it? There's no good reason not to do that. Speaking of transportation, ride hailing has been a big issue this year. Do you think we'll have ride hailing services on the road in 2019? Definitely not under the NDP. Because they have created this bizarre government-driven top-down mentality that instead of doing it on your cell phone, saying, I'm the customer, I'm in demand, I'm asking for a service, they've said, oh, no, no, government's going to decide how much demand there is. Government will allocate the number of licenses. Government will decide where they're allowed to drive. Government will decide the number of vehicles allowed on the road and the type of driver. And you and I look at each other and say, but that's all done by the consumer. Why are you just blocking this? And it's clear the NDP don't want it to happen. If there is an election in 2019, of course, there are a lot of variables that that would depend on. Would ride hailing be a priority of the Liberals should you secure government? Well, the NDP have made it a big issue because they are doing a slow walk to the death zone for ride hailing. And what we have said is, why not just get the level playing field, improve the insurance product for taxi drivers, make sure everybody's required to have the same class of license, which doesn't need to be a fancy truck driver license, make sure there's vehicle safety standards, and get on with it. Does there need to be any kind of compensation to the taxi industry? I think what the taxi industry is looking for is a viable economic model and telling them that they aren't allowed to go out of a particular zone to pay $37,000 in insurance on day one and to work from 4 p.m. to 4 a.m. to make sure you make ends meet is not going to work in the long run. They know that. They know that their their dispatch systems are changing. It's no longer where you phone up Yellow Cab and ask for somebody to come to your house. It's a matter of doing it online. And that's where it's going. They get that. What they're looking for is that level playing field, and that can be done. But the NDP want us to live in the past. I mean, think about it. It's 15 years now this has been underway. And we're still living in the past. What do you think of how British Columbia's LNG industry is getting up off the ground? Yeah, it's nice to see that the, the one positive bit of economic news the NDP bought into is the LNG industry. It's a huge opportunity because we have a very high value product in northeastern BC. It's not just natural gas. It's a whole collection of liquids within the natural gas. That comes out of the ground. It's much higher value than regular natural gas. But you've got to do something with all the gas. Well, it turns out people in Asia want to use it to replace coal. This is fantastic. Spend $41 billion, build a nice pipeline, ship it out of Kitimat send it off to Asia where it'll displace coal, improve the environment for the world, and we'll make a good amount of money off it. If the BC NDP don't have the support of the Greens for any legislation that might concern the LNG industry, do they have the support of the Liberals? Well, the, the Greens have caved on every single issue. Time after time after time, Andrew Weaver grandstands and says he's going to make ride hailing happen and he's going to stop the speculation tax. He caves in every time and votes for the NDP. So we give very little credence to what Andrew Weaver has to say about anything. In terms of the LNG industry, 
if there's legislation forthcoming, we'll be looking at it very critically to make sure it's the right deal for BC, but we support the industry. Do you think British Columbia, going back to your remarks around incentives for enhancing our competitive advantages here, do more in, are more incentives needed to attract more investment in this sector? What are your thoughts? Well, think about where we started with the American income tax or corporate tax cuts. It makes it very difficult for Canada to compete on the world stage now if the Americans are so much cheaper to deal with and their regulatory environment is getting easier and easier. That means Canada is at a significant disadvantage now. And we can't rely on the things we have monopoly on for too long. We've got good energy resources, got a good forest resource, but that's not going to employ 5 million people in this province. We need to be very strong in the services sector. We've got the people. We just need the right business environment to make it happen. As you know, we're all waiting on the results of our electoral reform referendum. If we see a vote in favor of some kind of proportional representation, what will that then mean for the Liberal Party and perhaps how you mobilize and campaign? Yeah, we had a caucus meeting about a week ago, and there's total uniformity there to say we will continue to stay as a unified party, fight the next election, which will continue to be on the existing system if it's before July 1 of 2021. Minority governments in Canada last two to three years. And these folks are coming to their second year. So we're watching the world uh, develop and be very interested to see the result from the referendum. One of the issues of great concern here in the greater Vancouver region, of course, is the availability of industrial land. The port is very concerned about this and is looking to provincial and federal governments for some kind of assistance in preserving that land and, and building it up so that we can meet our more ambitious trade agendas. What role do you think the provincial government could maybe play in either preserving industrial land or enhancing the kind of land and infrastructure we need to trade? I think there's room for a bit of an attitude shift in the Lower Mainland, particularly that land is for one use or the other, not both. Mm. If you look at places like Hong Kong, Paris, London, they use, you know, they'll have a car dealership on the ground floor and five stories of housing above it, or they'll have a auto repair shop on the ground floor, two stories of offices and 10 stories of housing on top of it. We have this fascination that they can only be single use. And interestingly, I was at a dinner in Richmond and councillors there are talking about the fact that there's way too much land in Richmond devoted to parking lots. So they want to say, look, you can build on top of parking lots like they've done at Ikea near Knight Street, where you'll have ground floor parking and then business on top of that. A very interesting thing they're talking about is seniors housing. They don't have enough in Richmond. And the whole basis is to say, why not have a mixed use facility? Put seniors housing in with light industrial buildings like the one we're in, which are light commercial. Why not have seniors housing on top of it? Tell me why we shouldn't do that. Because zoning is a municipal area of control, would it then be up to the provincial government, in your view, to maybe lead that attitude shift? What could the provincial government do? Incentives, incentives, incentives. <laughs> you know, municipalities have to be seen to be responding to demand and serving their citizens, and the provincial government can help with incentives. What would you say your priorities are for the year ahead? The key thing that we've got to get back to in British Columbia is a sense of opportunity for everybody. And my kids are 20, 22, 24. They currently don't foresee themselves living in BC because they don't see the combination of being able to find good, well-paid jobs and the cost of living. We've got to fix that because until that cohort of people from 20 to 35 feel confident about their future, we're looking at a pretty dim future where there are the haves and the have-nots. The NDP are doing their best to create friends and enemies, winners and losers, because that's politics for them. Our whole approach is Everybody needs to have that sense they're going to get ahead. There's a bright future opportunity for all of BC. And what do you foresee being the greatest challenges of 2019? Well, the greatest challenge is going to be getting some stability in Victoria because this fiasco with the Speaker is going to go on for some time. We've got the Nanaimo by-election going on. There'll be the follow-up from the proportional representation referendum. So we've got lots of stuff going on this winter, and the NDP are probably going to have another aggressive tax budget in the spring and we'll see if they're able to withstand the pressure from the public on that. Thank you very much for coming on the show. Always a pleasure. Glad to be here. And that's it for our show. Thank you for listening to BIV today. You can subscribe to us on iTunes and Stitcher, follow us for more business news on our social media accounts, and of course you can read and watch more business news over at BIV.com. I'm Haley Wooden. Thanks again for listening.